All right, as you might be able to see if you're looking at my face, I'm very tired because uh, I actually didn't sleep last night, uh, which it is fine. I'm coming off of a Sabbath day, and if I can't sleep, I'm just going to work. So that, that's why my face might look a little bit tired. But I'm full of words, so I'm going to take a drink from this uh, monster here, and maybe you can see the Chinese. This is what I'm used to over here. You just get used to it after a while. Um, in... Oh, it's a white monster, if you're listening by podcast, by the way. But, so in this culture, yes, you know, I sit down and I just kind of record these, boom, 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 and then I, I post them up later. Because I, this is, you know, if you watch the introduction to the, the Taiwan special, I, I had this, something clicked in my head, and all this just opened up. I started to start talking about this. For a long time, I've been keeping this in, not wanting to make waves or interfere with other countries. But I just kind of had enough. I should probably talk about this later. But, you know, Taiwan on the outside is very, very inviting. At the airports, oh, yeah, come teach at our school. You know, you get from these recruiters when you're trying to get an ESL job. Yeah, yeah, it's great. They'll teach, you You know, and they're super friendly. It's like they're scared that you're going to get mad and leave. And, and, I, and that raised a lot of eyebrows when I first was getting my job and I was coming over here and I, I saw how everything worked. I was at the airport. Everyone was so friendly. I'm like, they have a, you know, that's a borderline disorder. You know, many short-lived relationships, which again, I'm not an expert, but very, very oversimplification borderline disorder. If you need to remember the personality disorders, it's many short-lived relationships. Well, there's more to it than that. But, de but there we go. And I'm wondering, why are they so friendly like I'm going to run away? And I, I had this, this, you know, it, it's because of the shame culture and the legal system, which I'm about to explain to you. This stuff happens in the country and it's, it's, not, it's not lack of marketing that makes Americans or Westerners go to Taiwan, have difficulty, and then go home uh, in, in, in tears and upset. It's not lack of marketing. The marketing brings them here. It's the disastrous third world legal system in Taiwan that makes them get mad and, and leave. And, and usually, you know, a lot of times, they'll, 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 there's a lot of horror stories for how it happens. In the last previous episode, I talked about the college student. He couldn't, he, the, the college wouldn't teach him. And he talked to them about it and they wouldn't change. And he got mad and left. Now, I think he should have stayed and found a way to stay. But I also wonder if maybe he, he wasn't able to pass his classes because of it. And, of course, no one would say that um, because of self-respect. But I'll tell you, he certainly didn't get as good of grades as he could have. But that's Taiwan's legal system and they're surrendered to it. It's the, legal, the legal system is intertwined with the education system. A professor is like a miniature god. The professor and the boss, the teachers and bosses. And so in this context, in the ESL system, the, the English teaching system I explained last time, I'm going to draw what I wanted to draw before. And I try to explain this to people. And I always feel as if I'm speaking another language because people don't get what I'm talking about. The United States needs Taiwan to be strong for security reasons. For years, for decades, Taiwan's Air Force was stronger than China's. And Taiwan's very comparable to Israel, not in all ways, if Michael Cole is listening, but because uh, I've written articles about this comparing Taiwan to Israel, and then I cite his articles, and then Michael Cole, who was the editor writing for the current president, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, he would, you know, Taiwan, which has been wrongfully compared to Israel. And I'm like, Michael, I tried to talk with you a few times. I've emailed Michael. I love Michael. But um, in many ways, Taiwan is comparable to Israel. It's about twice the size, similar shape, has enormous enemies, friend of the United States, they're just, they're, uh, land flowing with milk and honey. They've got fruit here. Every year I learn about a new type of fruit. It's weird. There's all kinds of fruits Taiwanese don't know that they grow. There's there are fruits, plants growing on this island that government might not know about. It's 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 just it's a I mean they've got white water rapids they've got 
mountains to some of the Mount Jade is one of the tallest in the world. Um, it gets snow. It's tropical, but it gets snow in December and January at the very top. And there's a joke that up at the top of Mount Jade, there's a 7-Eleven because there's a 7-Eleven on every corner. And, and I always joke and say, which 7-Eleven at the top? Because <laughs> there's, you know, two. But, um, you know, Ty Taiwan is this amazingly epic little island. And in many ways, it does compare to Israel. In, in the, the, the collected nation, I'm not going to try to categorize all Muslims. I'm, I'm talking about the, I'm talking about the Muslims that you know I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, there, there is, um, of the Muslims, uh, there are Muslims that love Israel. I've talked with them and there's Muslims that don't. So specifically of the Muslims that don't love Israel, <laughs> they view, as you see on TV, Iraq was like this. Iran is, Israel is the little Satan and America is the great Satan. And they must destroy the little Satan first so that they can later attack the big Satan. That's their, their thinking. That's their philosophy. Well, China views America the same way. Only Taiwan is the little Satan. They don't call it that, but they've got to invade and occupy Taiwan so that that will counter Hawaii. So Taiwan is China's hoped for Hawaii. And the reason that they're building those little tiny islands in the Sprawlties is, well, no, it's not the Sprawlties. It's, it's Mischief Reef. They have to build these man-made islands because they can't occupy Taiwan. So they're going to do it some other way. They're going to do it. And no one's going to tell them no. And again, we're talking about, as I've said, shame culture is a collective something or other. So if you, if you, if you psychoanalyze it, if you put it on the couch and try to diagnose it with psychobabble, then China makes total sense. You've got to do that. If you guys at the State Department are listening, I pray that you get what I'm talking about. So, in, in this, the United States needs Taiwan to be strong. And for Taiwan to be strong, they've got to get rid of their third world legal system, including the grab education system. In order to get rid of that, they've got to have Americans here who'll just live and be patient and friendly and complain about little things and drop little teachable moments here and there like we normally do. As Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Live your life. I've, I've spent the last 10 years educating local restaurant owners that that little square cheese that comes in a stack isn't real cheese. They're all surprised. What? It's not cheese? Ugh. No. Cheese comes from cows. That stuff isn't allowed to be called cheese because it's not cheese. It's processed cheese. We call it American cheese. It was an American invention. It's from the age when we thought that factories and technology were the solution to everything. When, when it was the cool thing to cook the steak in the microwave at a restaurant. That was high class because it was techie. From that era, we got American cheese. And it's not real. And they don't know the difference. My, my uncle told me before I came here, he says, they don't have cheese. They think cheese is disgusting. And for the most part, that was largely true. They thought it would, you know, it was bad because it was gooey. They eat tofu. So recently, only recently have I seen people using more and more real cheese. When I go get my Chinese pancake in the morning, which I'm overdue for, by the way, I got to hurry up and get this. It's pushing 630. And I got to go get my Chinese pancake. But now they have real cheese, I'll put it. It's, it's, it's like a, it's kind of like a flour tortilla, but, but super oily. Really, really delicious. So, oh, look, look, up, look up Chinese pancakes. See what they, they put a fried egg on it. My, my Taiwanese uh, college classmate uh, would, would it, it'd take me to his mother's house and she'd cook me, a, she, she'd cook this Chinese pancake, set it down in front of me, and sit and smile and watch me eat it and get up and go cook me another one. And, and my friend, my buddy isn't even eating. And then, you know, this... Ha again, very Taiwanese culture. I'm so happy to have known uh, Ifu, uh, Li Ifu, um, Mike, Michael Lee. Um, so, United States needs Taiwan to be strong in order to get Westerners into Taiwan to spread around their culture. And, and, and I'm seeing cheese show up. I'm watching it show up. I've been honking at cars who are driving rudely. And they know what rude is, not looking and stuff. And more and more, people around me are honking on the row and people are rude and people are becoming more polite. Am I causing it? I hope that I don't make that big of a deal. But I would think that other Americans collectively, we might be. 
And it's, it's not about changing the culture. It's about just improving life. We want Taiwan to keep its culture, but the third world part of it's got to go. And, and part of that is getting an international view. And that can't happen without Westerners being in Taiwan and for Taiwanese to understand Western culture, even through movies and media and internet and so forth. And for that to happen, they've got to have good English. And I'm going to explain in this video what I always try to tell people. And it's, it's like this podcast also, I'm going to be talking through it, but the video on YouTube is by the same name is going to show some diagrams. I've talked about this in other videos. I'm going to keep talking about it in other videos from time to time. I feel like I'm speaking another language, no matter who I'm talking to, but this is the reason, pardon my French, that Taiwan doesn't have better English and America needs to have better English in Taiwan for all the reasons I explained. Now, at an ESL school, if you didn't listen to the, the, the talk just before this, you've got to go to it to understand what, how ESL schools work in the education structure. In order for, an, an, there's a thing, they call it a native English teacher. He's a native speaker. They talk about this, it's a thing. You get the idea, but it's a thing over here. So, a lot of times I'll call him the foreign teacher. And I've told people, no, he's not foreign, he's Western because people from Japan are foreign, but that's not who you're talking about. You're specifically talking about, and, they, and they've been getting that more and more, my friends, in Taiwan. In order for a native English teacher, such as an American ESL teacher, to teach at one of these cram schools, unless they're married, unless they're married. And, and of course, we don't want to say that marriage is the solution to everything because then they've got fake marriages. Taiwan actually tracks down fake marriages. So we're not, I'm, we're not going to say, we'll just get married and then you don't have to do this. They'll say that in the government, but then, then they turn around and they don't want fake marriages. Well, if you don't want fake marriages, the solution isn't to track down and, and spy on people to find out what marriages are fake marriages. People pretend to get married just so they can get the visa. The solution to not having fake marriages is to not make them so necessary. This is how law works. So unless you've got a marriage or as they push for, just get married. Uh, this, this is the requirement. In order for it, an American to teach ESL, that American needs to teach 14 hours in one week. We're talking one week, one week. A minimum of 14 hours in one week. Now, this person's getting double or triple typical salary. Four times what they make at McDonald's. So, in America, let's say minimum wage is $7. Yeah, we're talking $28 an hour, more than people make coming out of college. It's re they're required to make, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to, it's about four times the minimal salary. It's, it's in the top half. It's at least the, the half average white collar salary or above. White collar, not counting blue collar. Average white collar salary or above. It's about four times as far as money. It's not written that way, but that's what the numbers come out to. 14 hours. That's the equivalent of 60 hours worth of pay. Okay. For, for, especially for the other staff. Uh, other teachers will get half that amount of money. Office work, desk workers might get a quarter of that amount of money. Maybe. 14 hours and it has to all be at one single address. Not company or school. Address. And the reason it has to be at one address, there's actually no reason for it. They don't state a reason. The reason is so the government can be lazy and because and, it looks good on paper to the bureaucrats. That's the reason. It has to be 14 hours at one address. Now, they'll say, well, we have to make sure it's at one company. This, I could go into the problem. In fact, I should, I should I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab my pen here and I'm going to write that down as something that I need to talk about sometime. Um, cause I need to talk about the, um, the address, address in, in companies in one of these, because I, 
Taiwan doesn't seem to understand the concept of a web-based company. And so there's a black market for false company addresses because Taiwan's government hasn't discovered that the internet exists. It's amazing. It's like, wow. But when you've got, when you've got a shame culture, culture-wide personality disorder set, set of personality disorders, then it all makes sense. Solution is to get more Americans going, duh, 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 and then they'll believe it. But they don't. And con Congress could, everything I'm telling you, Congress could call Taiwan's office. The State Department, Congress could put together a little package. The State Department could call Taiwan's office and say, um, <clears throat> is this true in your country? Uh, maybe you should change it. And the problem could be solved overnight that way. Could be solved overnight. We have 14 hours at one address because they're obsessed with one address identifying one company. Because that's how it has to be, right? And then if, after you've got 14 hours at one address, you're allowed to have another job with six hours, three such jobs, three such jobs with six hours, six, six, six. You can have, you, have an, an, you know, you got, you got one address. I'm gonna draw a little dot here for one address. And then you can have another job, another job, another job, three other jobs, minimum six hours. These are all minimums. All these are minimums. These are all minimums. Now, the problem with this is that in the work week, school gets out at four. So students go to their cram school, which is like the, it's kind of a false religion here. It's the school and the test, sacrifice their children on the altar of the test make them conform. Don't be, don't do what you're good at. Do what society needs you to do. How dare you do what you're good at? You need to do what your father tells you. If God made you a good singer, God was wrong. Your father is God. You're going to pray to him after he dies because we worship ancestors, right? It's like weird. So we've got till about 4 p.m. until about 9 p.m., Actual good hours, class hours are going to be from about five to nine. So that's four hours, four times five, 20. Uh, let's be conservative. We're talking about 15 hours here. If he's working uh, maybe five to eight or 5.30 to 8.30 when the good classes are, 15 hours. Now there's his 14 hour minimum. He's working 15 hours total, maybe 20. Where does he have time? Those are the teaching hours, Monday through Friday. Where does he have time to fit another six-hour part-time job? That's, those six-hour part-time jobs are a joke. That's not going to happen. It might happen once in a while. The government, well, you're allowed to, allowed to, but they don't exist. Uh, time, the government allows me to, but the clock doesn't. I can't be in two places at once. And the government doesn't get that. Who are you to tell me this? You didn't pass the test, so you don't know. You have to pass a test to be a politician in Taiwan, of course. So, uh, you know, so, so you, you've got to have 14 hours at one address and there's only about 20 good hours during the week. And what are you going to do? Are you going to get a job teaching from four to five and then drive 20 minutes uh, to start the other class that starts at five o'clock? No way. In fact, many times at the schools, they want you to be there one or two hours early that they do not pay you for. You're only getting paid for the teaching time, by the way. That's the other thing. Very sad, very sad. So this is the requirement. Now, if I'm going to see if I can change colors here. That's what the government requires. If, if I were to draw, I'm going to see if I can draw a little map over here. This is what the government requires. If, if life worked the way the government, the way these government minimums, you, have, you need to have 14 hours at one school and then six hours, you can have up to three, six hours. Now you can have 12 hours in another school. That's allowable. That's okay. Uh, but these are just minimums, okay? If, if, if we were to look at a little map and I were to draw a number representing an ESL school on this map, and how many hours they actually need, how much they got money for, what they've got students for. This is what the map would look like, how the government seems to think reality works. Here's 14, here's six, six, six. 14, six, 
six six fourteen six 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 fourteen six six six. That's what this law, the current law in Taiwan, seems to think. The uh, the the government, the the actual market needs. That's what they think now. My question would be, if they're going to say this is correct, I would ask for them to find proof by having every single school that's registered. You have to be registered as an English teaching school. There's, there's like, you know, child safety and fire code stuff. The fire department actually approves an English teaching school, by the way, a cram school, any cram school, the, the fire department, because it's fire code. I would ask for them to look at every single ESL, licensed ESL school to get two witnesses from a Westerner to state that you know, how many hours they're offering and how many hours they need. I would ask if they have such proof, such researched, surveyed proof from the registered schools reporting it and two Westerners from another country in Taiwan agreeing, saying that it's true, for how many hours they need as a minimum. Do they have such evidence in Taiwan proving that this is what the market needs? The answer is no. This was not, this law wasn't made because it's what Taiwan needs. It was made because it's what the bureaucracy thinks is easy. And now I'm going to show you reality from my experience. Four two, four hours. Here's a school that needs four hours. Here's a school that needs four hours. Here's a school that needs eight hours. Oh, they could be a part-time school. Here's one that needs four hours, four hours, three, two, one, 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 four, 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 sixty. 70, 28, 28, 4, 4, 4. That's my experience for what schools need. Now, those great big schools, they need 28 hours. They could hire one teacher full time. It pretty would make a lot of money. 70 hours, they're going to need to hire more than one teacher. In fact, the school needs 28 hours. They're probably going to have to hire more than one teacher because they're probably having more than one class at once. Most of the other schools, you've got a family that lives in the building upstairs and, you know, because they live in townhouses, as I explained. And then on the first floor, that's a family business. It's like mom runs a daycare at her home, but it's on the first floor. It's government registered and they just need an American to come in and practice talking to the kids. You know, hopefully the American knows what he's doing. I've got my pink right website, right.pink. It's, it's a web address. I just got books that came out last week. And I, I hope to be able to make ESL teachers more effective with those books in that website. But even if not, they just need an American to come in and say stuff for the kids to try to understand. To, to, to get a little bit irritated and tell the kids to correct their accents and then the kids are glad. You know, no, 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 say it this way. You know, and the kids are happy for it and the American's happy you made a difference. They just need that. But all these numbers are over the four, the one, the eight. Now the eight is kind of legal if, because that could be a part-time job, but no one has time. By the time you've got a full-time job, your schedule doesn't have room for a part-time job. It's called a part-time job. Six hours or, or you know more is a part-time job. 14 hours more is a full-time job in legal, the legal lingo of ESL teaching. And these are actual teaching hours, not office hours. And they will require office hours and not pay you for them. And the government doesn't care. Well, that's between you and them. Uh, right, right. That's, that's the universal cop-out on human rights. And it's actually that kind of stuff where I began to understand what my black friends in America meant when they kept saying the system is stacked against black people. I didn't know what they meant. Living in Taiwan, I know what they mean. Totally, I get that. I understand black people in America because I lived in Taiwan 10 years. 
And of course, because I was in Cabrini Green every day for four years while I was in college in Chicago. So all this, all these schools here, all these, the, most schools, most ESL schools in Taiwan are illegal. It's illegal for them to teach English. They can only teach Chinglish because they're not allowed to have an American. You can't have an American come to your school and teach you. You're too small. That's what the law says. That's not how it's written, but that's what the actions say. We've had a new president in Taiwan push in two years now, over two years. And she hasn't changed this. That makes me a little bit sad, but I'm willing to give her the benefit of the doubt that she just doesn't know. Because really, there's a lot that the government just doesn't know about reality here. I, I genuinely believe Tsai Ing-wen is a good person. The, the president of Taiwan who called Trump on Skype to congratulate him. Taiwan's got to get this figured out. This has defined most English schools as illegal if they have a native English speaker teaching them. Now, the solution to this, solution, this is very simple. In fact, I, I'm going to do a solution time. I always like to, I want to talk about solutions. So I'm going to talk about solution. You have an ESL license. See, the, the reason that the law exists the way it does is they make a work permit. They make work permit. It's called a permit. It has, it's like a building permit. It's per address. Literally, the work permit is like a building permit. It's address specific, a building permit in America. The work permit and the residence visa and ESL teaching are the same question. They're one question. All the requirements are the same. And it's really the residence visa that, that makes it work. In order to teach English, you have to have a work permit. To have a work permit, you have to qualify for a residence visa. Oh, isn't that convenient for the bureaucracy that doesn't know reality? That's why this is happening. What they need to do is they need to make these, they need to make the teaching, permission to teach a completely separate question from work permit and residence visa. Keep the laws on the books where they are, but get a separate program that does ESL as a license. If the, if the teacher meets the, the pure, the, the education, I mean, this goes through three different uh, ministries, they call them ministries, even though they're not, they don't have an Anglican church here, but again, translation problems. It should have been called a department, but they don't know English, so they'll call it a ministry. <sighs> so <laughs> the work permit goes to the labor department, the Ministry of Labor. Residence visa, that goes through immigration, which is part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Ministry of, um, uh, is it international? Uh, international, any of the, the, there's the foreign, foreign relations. Um, and then you have uh, the teaching license, which goes to the Ministry of Education, the Education Department. If the teacher meets the requirements from the Education Department, then give a license. There, problem solved. They don't get a visa, but they're allowed to teach and at multiple addresses, regardless of the address. It's so simple. It can be done tomorrow. It, 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 no new laws need to be written other than just that we'll maybe make these separate. It's like a little, little footnote. We're pass, voting on a footnote. The law to be passed would just be a footnote. It'd be a miniature amendment. It's, it's all it would need. There could be a little bit more. I think that they should get a tax book and a reporting book. Like the teacher should have to take a little test and, on how to pay taxes and how to calculate and the rules for how to be a teacher and how to collect money and stuff. That, that, that would make sense. Like a little driving test. A little miniature test, easy, easy to study, easy to get help, pay at a post office, which also doubles as a bank, interestingly. Like, you know, they could do that. This is so easy to solve, but Taiwan's not going to solve it on their own. They, the Taiwan government's heard about this. I've written about this at Pink Right. 
And it's not going to change unless U.S. Congress tells Taiwan to do it because they won't listen. I've gone to a legislator's aid and explained this and they didn't get it. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with a story from that conversation. I was talking to legislators. A, he was very kind and, and agreed to, to talk with me and hear what I had to say. And um, I, I explained these numbers. He didn't believe me. I said, okay, well, don't trust everything, but just hear me out for now. I'll go verify facts later. And then I told him a story. I said, I said, you know, in Taiwan, when the Americans and the Westerners all get together, one of the things we talk and joke about is how bad the English is in the marketing. A lot of, a lot of companies do marketing and they need English. And it's terrible. You, you could ask a German about the English and he could correct it. Like it's like, cause Germans study English, but it's a second language. Like the mistakes are really terrible. They don't even bother to just even ask an American. Um, I mean, I've, I've had friends ask me about English before getting a tattoo, uh, which was a smart move. <laughs> you know, you know about Americans getting tattoos in other languages, you know, Chinese tattoos, Hebrew tattoos, you know. And so when the Americans get together, we kind of joke and laugh at Taiwan's marketing English. It's one of the things that comes up. It's laughable. Well, there's a, I heard a story, never met her. I heard a story about a girl that was doing marketing design for a small company. I, I, I don't know who, I don't know how to find the person. The person was doing marketing and design, graphic design for a small business in Taiwan. They didn't have enough money to give her 14 hours a week as a full-time job. So they hired her illegally under the table. Now, as I told this to this legislator's aide, he was angry. What? I said, well, would you make a law that allows them to get the English help they need and they can afford? Of course not. Why would they do that? I said, do you know why they hired her illegally? He said, why? Why? I said, because they love Taiwan. They don't want Taiwan to be a laughing stock for the Americans. They don't want Americans taking a picture of their marketing advertisements, making fun of the terrible English in Taiwan. They don't want Taiwan to continue its longstanding bad reputation in America as not having good English on the instructions for how to use the technology and the little instruction book that comes with the, the watch you buy and stuff. They want Taiwan to have a good reputation and that's why they break your silly law. He kind of trembled and didn't know what to say because again, we've got a shame culture where no one speaks directly. That's all for today.